Welcome to Voice of Supply Chain brought to you by ISM New Jersey and Source Day. The purpose of our show is to tell stories of people in procurement and supply chain doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder. I oversee marketing for Source Day. We automate purchase order changes and enable supplier collaboration for manufacturers, distributors, CPG brands, and retailers. If you want to talk more about women in ERP or what's happening in the manufacturing world, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and follow my two hashtags, women in ERP and manufacturing maven. Today, our guest is MBK. MBK, I feel like you're, uh, it's, it's your week. You were just on another one of our uh, shows yesterday. So thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we're going to go back in time and start with talking about your childhood. And the, the purpose of this show is a little bit different in that we want to tell your personal journey and your personal story about how you got to where you are today. So I'd like to start with um, having you share a favorite childhood memory. Yeah, thanks for having me. First and foremost, Sarah, it's always good to see you and I'm glad you're, uh, you're feeling better. Um, look, my favorite childhood memory, I was born and raised in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and I, if I reflect back, I think the biggest thing or my favorite childhood memory has been just growing up uh, in an environment where I was exposed to lots of different cultures, lots of different nationalities, uh, lots of different habits. I had friends from almost every walks of life, every part of the world. And so what if I reflect back on my favorite childhood memory, it, it probably is that that it taught me uh, at a very young age that, uh, you know, diversity in thought, diversity in 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 upbringing, uh, religion, uh, you know, opinions. Uh, it really uh, it, that's probably my favorite childhood memory. I, I have lots of other I had a really good, um, uh, you know, uh, childhood, if you will. But. Uh, that's probably my favorite one is to be at, a, at an early age, get exposed already to, um, yeah, to lots of different, uh, yeah, cultures and nationalities. What one thing stands out from your childhood that shaped you to be that the person you are today? Um, yeah. So besides what I just described uh, as being my favorite childhood memory, uh, I also was a very, um, you know, passionate uh, football player or, or uh, you know, as some Americans call it soccer, uh, but we call it football. Um, and um, and what it a big team player, uh, you know, I was the captain for for most of that time. Um, so it taught me, you know, the importance of, you know, leading by example uh uh you know work hard i wasn't maybe necessarily technically the most advanced player but i tried to make up for that in effort uh and work hard and and be part of a team and that together you you drive you know better outcomes in this case on the pitch uh you know you train hard three four days a week and then on saturday and then later on on sunday you have that moment where you you know get to compete against another team and uh, didn't always win. I'm a very bad loser, as uh, some of the listeners will probably know. Uh, you know, and I'm you know hyper competitive. Uh, but yeah, that that really shaped me. Um, you know, in terms of you know together driving to uh, you know common outcomes and and uh, but also the, the the fact that I was the, the leader of the team uh, as being the captain. It it also taught me a lot about leadership at a young age. Does this mean you're a Ted Lasso fan? Uh, yeah, to some degree. Yeah, you could probably call me a Ted Lasso fan. Yes, I, yes, yes, I, yes, I could say yes. I've binged season one and two. I'm anxiously awaiting season three. Yeah, it is. It is quite good. I'm, I'm not a binge watcher, so I've seen a few. Uh, uh, I'm not a binge, binge person, but uh, yes. What's a tradition you learned from your parents that you've continued on with your family? Yeah, uh, that was an interesting because, of course, these are some of the, the seated. Uh, in my family, we're not very uh, big about traditions. So, you know, like it's not like, you know, Mother's Day or Father's Day or Christmas or, you know, those traditional things. I, I think the thing that I learned is, you know, family time is really important. Uh, we do always enjoy coming together as a family. 
Um, you know, I live on the other part of the side of the world. My parents are in, in Amsterdam uh, or close by in Amsterdam and I'm in Vancouver today. Um, but it's, I, I think that the, the tradition is just coming together as a family. Uh, you know, I'm a really big family man. I got three kids or we have three children. Um, and, um, you know, to me, family is really, really important. It always has been very important to me. Um, and, and I think I got that from, from my parents. So that's maybe the tradition is just finding time to, to be together as a family is, is important. Most influential person in your childhood and why? Um, yeah, I thought about it long and hard and, and very typically you start to think about your parents and, um, you know, I think my dad is probably, uh, has had the most influence on me, not because he was around a lot. My dad worked a lot and, uh, to, to support a, a, a family of three kids. And, uh, my dad was a taxi driver. And so he worked a lot at weird hours and didn't always see him a lot, but at least he taught me, uh, you know, hard work, uh, pays off. Um, he worked really, really hard, like 12 hours a day and sometimes seven days a week and drive a lot. And every time you're on the, on, on the street, you'd make money. Right. Um, but he also came from, he was one zero down. My dad was an orphan. Uh, he was born right at the end of the second world war. Uh, not everybody knows this, but I'm fine sharing. Um, and until the age of 12, he was raised in an orphanage. And, um, you know, when you're, your character is formed as a person until the age of 13. So what I admire about my dad, I'm, I'm not even sure if I've really told him ever, uh, really this way, but um, what I admire is that he was still able to overcome um, some of the challenges that you have when you're raised in an orphanage for 13 years of your life, 12 years of your life, and still be able to raise a family, uh, know what the priorities are. My, my parents have been married for well over 50 years now. Uh, and, um, yeah, just, I mean, I do admire that, you know, like a lot of people let their, um, past catch up with them and, and, uh, and he's been able to, to, to work that out. Uh, not always easy. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I do. And he taught me a lot around, you know, prioritization, um, work hard, um, remember where you came from, you know, that kind of stuff. What's the one thing you learned as an adult that you wish you knew as a kid? Um, patience. Um, I am still very, very impatient, um, but I'm much, much better than I, I was uh, when I was younger. Um, and um, yeah, character is everything. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, David. Um, it's it's patience and um and you don't always have to uh you know um yeah i i think patience I, that's how i would respond to that it's it's something i i wish i knew when i was younger also in your career yeah i know we're going to probably talk about that in a bit but uh patience is uh, is important so you and i both share something in common in that we both majored in economics so curious to know why. Um, let's see. I've always been a numbers guy. So when I was in, um, in uh, I think you call it uh, kindergarten and middle school, I think you call it in the US and, and we slightly different in Europe, but uh, that, that early just until you're 12, um, I was doing high school math when I was nine years old. So I, I've always been a math whiz i'm very good with numbers um and um and then when i started to understand you know a bit more the world when i went to high school i started to realize uh you know how important economy and economic development is in 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 the world um how it can really uh change uh countries and and, and how it can change people's lives and so i really quickly understood that i wanted to do something with with my numbers um uh, hat um didn't really like algebra for example i didn't I, I did it but i didn't really like it but i like to apply my numbers and my ability to to make sense out of numbers uh and so very quickly you then come to economics and accounting uh and, and those were the two majors that i did um and uh banking and insurance i very quickly realized that that would be something that i could get really passionate about what's the most important thing you learned while going to college um, wow. What's the most important thing? 
well, one that I uh, I I couldn't wait uh, to get into the real world. Um, I, I I I I'm not sure if this is the right thing to say, but uh, but I'll say it anyway. I I am a big believer in yeah, you need to have a certain baseline. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to get my degree as quickly as I could because I couldn't wait to go into the real world and and get out there and and get experience. Uh, so I graduated when I was 21, which is relatively young, I think. Um, <laughs> So, so maybe one, I, I learned that I wasn't going to be, uh, um, you know, I wasn't going to do any post-grad or, or anything like that. I knew I was gonna, wasn't going to do that. Um, I think the other thing is that you don't always have to be the smartest kid in the room uh, because I, there were some really, really smart people where I, uh, in, in my um, uh, years in school. And, and that's okay that you're not always the smartest person in the room. Uh, I think those are probably the two big things that I learned. Um, I hope that made sense. Perceived worst advice you received in college that actually turned into useful advice later in your career? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one for me to answer. Um, I didn't really think I got any bad advice uh, that that I could turn into something positive. I think in um, in my uh, in my high school years, I had a mentor um, that. Um, you know, I, I was the kind of student that liked to challenge uh, my teachers and ask them the why and ask them, well, why is this relevant? Why does this matter? Like not in a in a judgmental way, but I wanted to always understand during my school years um, that, you know, I was always interested in, well, how does this apply to, you know, to the world, to the real, you know, outside? And and some teachers didn't necessarily like that. Um and so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but my mentor was really important to me in my high school years, and, and I'm still in touch with him, and I've thanked him several times. Um, and I and I said to him, I said, look, the piece of advice that he gave me is to never be afraid to to speak up. But there were teachers who actually told me that I I should stop asking the question. You know what I mean? And so what I saw, so it's maybe a double edged here that I'm answering the question is the advice that I got is to occasionally not challenge. But my mentor actually at the same time said, do it. Um, and I'm still grateful for that. Um, but uh, but it also got me into trouble sometimes in school because not all teachers like that. So you liked numbers, which is why you majored in economics and accounting. What did you think you were going to do after graduation? Uh, accounting. So my my first role was at Arthur Anderson. Uh, and, uh, and I thought I was going to be an accountant. Um, and... Uh, so when I graduated, that was my dream is to join Arthur Anderson because Arthur Anderson back in the day when I graduated in 90, is it 95 or 97 in that time, uh, the best accounting firm in the world uh, was Arthur Anderson, uh, the, the big five. Uh, and those that are PwC and Ernst & Young would disagree. Uh, but um, anyway, so I really wanted to go after accounting and, and I wanted to work for the best accounting firm in the world, which, which I, I managed to get into Arthur Anderson at the time. And from what I recall from look, checking out your profile um, online, you d you decided not to go back and get a master's. Is that correct? That's correct. So again, you and I share that as well. Would love your thoughts on, or maybe walk walk us through the reason why you decided not to go back and get a master's. Yeah, it's it's I, I kind of maybe gave it away a little bit earlier. I I I do believe in having a certain foundation when it comes to uh, knowledge coming out of books, but I'm a very practical, pragmatic person. Uh, that's why I think I do what I do today in supply chain and finance procurement. I, I do feel it's very pragmatic. Um, I just couldn't wait to get out into the real world. I, I just knew I I. I was craving knowledge that I didn't feel I was getting out of uh, the books. Um, but that I wanted to learn um, in 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 business in 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 companies and apply some of the, the theory into practice and um, and I still learn every day. Yeah, I every every day I learn uh, in my role, even today, still today at, at Coupa. Um, and I, I felt like I couldn't get that out of uh, out of my books. Now, I'm not saying that that's for everybody, um, and I'm certainly not discounting the fact of the importance of having degrees. I'm not advocating for not having any, um, but I also know that a lot of the very famous and successful entrepreneurs 
uh, didn't even finish college. Um, so I, it, it's it. Everybody learns in a different way. My wife, uh, on the other hand, is a constant learner, and uh, she has more degrees than I can probably put up into my office. So I'm, my my point is, it's it's people learn different differently and have different ways of of uh, developing and growing in in life. Mm -hmm. School is not my thing, and my boyfriend has a PhD, so I can relate. Well, there you go. I didn't even know that. So hey, there we go. <laughs> So your first gig after college was in accounting. What was the best and worst part of your first gig? Yeah, the, the best part is, um, you know, I did work for Arthur Anderson, which I, again, I can't speak highly enough of. Uh, and I worked with some incredible people, super smart. Um, you know, I, I learned a ton. I did a lot of consulting there. So the best part of my gig there was that I got to look in many, many kitchens uh, as in companies, um, in my first two years of my career, it allowed me to work for uh, GE. Uh, I worked for the Dutch Railways. Um, I worked for Sterling Commerce that I ultimately I did join after. Uh, I, I loved the fact that I could learn a lot in a very short period of time, get exposed to some really great uh, resources, both uh, people, but also, you know, the, the libraries that they had, the thought leadership that came from AA at the time, um, white papers. And I, I craved that because those were real life examples. And so I, the first two years, I, I, my chargeability, as they called it, is was like 200% because I, I worked my ass off, if I may say, but it's because I recognized uh, the opportunity that I was given. Um, and I was a sponge. So I, I just did everything. I said yes to everything. And I did every single project that I was given. And, and I, I learned a ton. I think the worst part of that gig was um, as a consultant, you come in, you do something, you do something for a certain period of time, you make something better, you implement something, uh, you write, a, you know, I did accounting manuals, I implemented ERP, I did a bunch of different things together with a group of people. But when the project was done, you were always off to the next the next project and uh what i missed was learning from my projects uh also from my mistakes uh and opportunities to do things better next time and i i missed that and that's what ultimately led me to leave my consulting after two years is because i i, I lacked that uh, feedback so you left your consulting gig what next yeah, I joined uh, the customer I was working for at the time, Sterling Commerce, uh, and um, I went into accounting. Uh, there was a deep accounting role. Um, I had a great leader there, uh, Jan Peter de Hoog, uh, a really good friend of mine still today. I spoke to him literally like four weeks ago um, and um, uh, did a lot of accounting work there, uh, tax accounting, statutory accounting, corporate income tax, uh, deep uh, accounting knowledge. Um, and uh, managed to start to travel for work globally. I went to Japan, I went to the US, uh, I went to France, England, uh, and I traveled quite a lot. Um, and um, yeah, again, you know, had, had a great ecosystem of people supporting me within Sterling. Um, and um, yeah, that was the first time that I really felt like I was taking myself, I was starting to build a career, if you will. So you, you were still in accounting. How did you transition into procurement? It's my wife. It's my wife's fault, um, which is kind of true. Um, I, I, after Sterling, I, uh, I moved to Food Locker. Uh, Sterling, um, I, I, did, I set up a finance shared service center for Nuance in Europe, or I, it's always we, yeah? it's never just me. But I, when I say I, I mean we, of course. Um, then I moved to Food Locker and at Food Locker, um, I was the European controller and I was asked if I was interested in implementing e-sourcing uh, with a company called Iasta at the time. Um, again, it's a little while ago in the early 2000s. Um, and that's how I met my wife. Um, she worked for uh, Free Markets, uh, then moved to Iasta and um, we implemented e-sourcing. And... Um, mm. Yeah, that's that's how I got passionate and excited about uh, procurement and sourcing and bring my finance brain with my supply chain procurement and driving value and and making fact based decisions. And uh, yeah, that's really when I realized that finance was maybe not my career. 
Uh, it's kind of repetitive every quarter, every year. Sarbanes Oxley wasn't there at the time, but you know, of course, is now there today. And compliance and U.S. GAAP accounting and RefRAC and and it's. I'm not saying it's not fun, but it wasn't necessarily what I got passionate about. But what I did like was bring my finance brain together with my desire to to be part of the business and drive business value. And uh, and that's how I really recognized that I that my passion and my future was going to be in sourcing and procurement and supply chain. But um, my wife reminds me occasionally that it's her fault. <laughs> I hope that well, we'll, we'll need to interview her on our show sometime as well. Yes. Yes. That would be fun. So what next? Walk me through uh, the, the rest of your career path. Yeah, then I, I moved to VF uh, and um, uh, at VF, uh, I initially started in finance, but very quickly said, hey, why don't we have procurement in Europe? Uh, we've got all these brands. So VF is a house of brands, uh, Lee, Wrangler, uh, North Face, uh, Kipling, Eastpac, Jansport, uh, Timberland, Vance, uh, et cetera, and 30 brands. Grew very rapidly, did some acquisitions. And, um, and I said, why don't we... Why don't we have procurement in Europe? Like the spend is, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and we don't have any procurement. And why don't we have it? And I just came from Foot Locker and, and I said, hey, there's so much value we can create. And I started with shopping bags. Uh, it's a funny story. Like every brand, of course, has a shopping bag. And um, in some cases, the same supplier was charging different prices for similar specifications. And so I aggregated the spend, ran a competitive RFP, demonstrated that we could save a million bucks. and. Um, and that's when VF realized, hey, Michael, why won't you go set up the procurement function in Europe, which we did. Um, that went really well, uh, had lots of great support, uh, great leadership uh, that really recognized the value that procurement can bring to the table in Europe. Um, then I was asked to lead a global transformation with VF uh, together with McKinsey. Um, and uh, that got me to the US. Uh, so at a very young age, uh, I always told my mother and my father, that I wanted to go work in the US. That was one of, I told them I, when I was five years old, I started talking about that. So when that opportunity came, I was like, wow, you know, check the box. So I moved to Greensboro, North Carolina uh, um, and uh, spent a couple of years there, led global transformation uh, at VF. Um, that went really well. And then I got a phone call to say, hey, would you like to do this kind of same thing at Lululemon, uh, which at that time uh, had no procurement, no, no real rigor no structure, no governance, no, no procurement really. Um, and it felt like a great opportunity. It's in Vancouver, a uh, great city. And uh, it made sense for the family. It made sense professionally. And so I did that for four and a half years and both VF and Lululemon are Coupa customers. I've been a fan of Coupa for a long time. Um, and then, you know, once you set it up and it runs, you're kind of ready maybe for the next gig. And, uh, and that's when the opportunity came to join the mothership uh, which is where I am today uh, at Coupa. And I, I consider it honestly an honor and a privilege to be the chief procurement officer at Coupa Software. Um, you know, being in my role uh, is almost like being the head of marketing at Marketo or the head of HR or, you know, like, et cetera, the head of sales at Salesforce. Um, and it's just a, a tremendous honor. And, and it's, it's honestly, I feel like everything I've done so far has led me to where I am today, uh, which is, you know, probably the best, um, uh, I just sold my house in Greensboro, David. Um, um, great place to live, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's kind of led me to where I am today, which is an, a, an amazing feeling to have, uh, if you can say career-wise, that you feel like you're at the right place at the right time of your career and you're driving real value for the company I work for today. Um, yeah, it, it's a great feeling. So you said a couple interesting things, one of them being two of the organizations you worked for had no procurement function. So what did that look like? Yeah, it meant that the business made decisions on what suppliers to select, uh, how to negotiate with them, um, and, um, and, and what mattered to do the business. Now, that is, of course, all really important. Um, you know, of course, I am here to support the business and I'm here to drive better business outcomes. But I do say negotiation and procurement is a career. Uh, it's a profession. It's a skill. Uh, it's teachable. It's not rocket science. Uh, procurement is not rocket science, or at least it shouldn't be. Um, we're here to support the business, but it is something that that deserves time and attention. 
Um, and I'm also going back in time, right? VF today has a very mature procurement function, uh, mm -hmm. you know, led by Zach and Patrick Tewksbury and, and others, um, very mature function. Um, but I'm going back in time, right? 10 years ago, uh, where, you know, it was immature, was very tactical, very operational in nature. Um, and it means that, you know, companies are not optimizing the value, uh, opening up the risk. Uh, and we all know what that means and what that could result into, especially over the past two years with all the disruption we've seen, that if you have no maturity in your supply chain, you don't know your suppliers, you don't know enough about your suppliers, uh, what that could do to your, to your business. Uh, so it looks very frantic is, is what the answer is. Kind of like chaos is what I imagine. Yeah, I kind of describe it to your teenage years. You know, when you're a teenager, you don't have to be fiscally responsible and necessarily think about where the money goes and how much you pay for certain things because you can just maybe be a little bit more opportunistic. Uh, but as you grow and mature as a business, uh, you have to understand your supply chain, your suppliers, the risk you are willing to take trade-offs you're making between maybe single source versus having several options when it comes to where you get your stuff from. And so um, I think giving that kind of uh, maturity to your organization will just set you up for more success and, and, and get you to mature procurement uh, and ultimately drive innovation, which is you know the holy grail of, of any procurement function. So the other thing that, that stood out to me in your career story is the fact that you started out in Europe actually and building out a procurement function there. What, what would you say were the biggest differences at the time for running and being in procurement in Europe versus the US? Yeah, I, I think we, um, we in Europe, we, um, you know, I, I'd say we have the tendency to be very, very direct uh, and 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 not be afraid to challenge the status quo. I of course need to be mindful. I, I'm not trying to disres be, be disrespectful here, but you know we really we we went across the brands. Uh, we started leveraging spend across the brands. The brands were very very receptive. Um, you know whether it's North Face or Vance or Lee or Wrangler. You know standardizing shopping bags uh, across brands uh, to go to one supplier. Of course, de-risk the supply chain across factories, etc. But you know, that was not very sensitive at all when the brands realized that, hey, we can uncover resources that you can reinvest back into the business um, uh, and uh, and yeah, and improve efficiencies. Right. And, and exactly what you're saying, David. Yeah. Um, it, it's not just about cost. It's about driving more value. It's how can you accelerate objectives? How can you potentially I would said to marketeers, how would you like me to give you 20 percent more budget? Uh, and now marketeers are listening to you, right? I mean, you're a marketeer, Sarah. You know exactly where I'm going with that. Um, and um, and that was the value prop. And that re went really, really well. In the US, it required a little bit more uh, convincing. Um, and, um, you know, I never believe in, you know, somebody being mandated and pushing it down a business. I do believe in procurement having its own elevator pitch and, and driving from within and really collaboratively drive better business outcomes. We got there in the end. We saved a significant amount of money uh, at VF at the time. And uh, but it was a little more challenging than I than I originally anticipated to get all the brands to um, to get behind the journey. Um, ultimately, a phenomenal project, uh, great results. Uh, it really took my career to the next level. Um, had a great support from the operating committee all the way from the CEO and, and everybody else. So it's never a one man show, but, um, yeah, I still have really good memories of that project, but it, especially in the beginning, it took a lot of convincing. One of the things that really stands out for me about you is your passion for leveraging technology and implementing technology in procurement and supply chain. Why? Why do you think you've been so successful in your career before joining Coupa in implementing technology? It's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to go out and buy something, but to actually implement something that's utilized and works is a, is a completely different story. So would like to have you share with us 
you know, one of the, w what you learned um, and yeah. you, know, you, I'm sure you stumbled along the way as well, but you yeah. more than most, I think have been very successful in this area. No, thank you. And there, there's, there's tons of others, but I appreciate, I appreciate it. Um, look, I, I think there's a few things important uh, when it comes to driving transformation. I think the first one is, um, you know, don't be afraid uh, to, uh, to build some scars along the way. Um, and trust me, I have some, um, where you're not afraid to challenge the status quo, uh, to stand up, uh, to lead, um, and to also take accountability. Even if you maybe don't have the responsibility, you can still take accountability for the outcomes. Um, that is risky because, you know, if things don't go the way they, you plan them, uh, you could get into trouble. Um, but I do believe in, you know, be bold, uh, get out there. And if you're not doing that, then I don't think you can be successful in procurement. It's, it's my, my, my opinion. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that is one key takeaway. I think the other thing that I think, uh, is, is really, um, important is that you, you take, like I owned the digitization journey, not it, not finance, not the business. No, I was, I said, look, it is procurement's responsibility to drive better business outcomes in the business spending that we have. Um, and we need to do that through the power of technology. And I want to take responsibility and accountability for the investment. Uh, but it should be my procurement decision, uh, not IT. Uh, that's like mechanics buying their own car. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And I was fortunate enough that I have to say this, right? It's important that I had leadership that trusted me, uh, but also listened. And also I had IT leaders, which is not always the case, um, that recognized and said, hey, that is very different. You know, that the language that you're using there is very different. And I said, look, I said, I want to partner with IT. Of course, you're important. Data integrity, uh, integration, um, you know, all those things, single source of truth, they all matter. Cost of maintaining it, that is all important. But it shouldn't be IT determining what platform we're going to deploy. That is procurement. That's my responsibility. And uh, and I had great partnership, both at VF and at Lululemon. Uh, excellent partnership. Uh, I still have lots of connections at both. Um, but it's important that procurement stands up and lead. And I think that was the secret. Uh, that is the secret to success, in my opinion. So I hope that that made sense. Where does ERP fit into the mix of everything? Yeah, ERP is, uh, I'm not going to say necessary evil, um, but um, maybe I just did. Um, ERPs are good. You know, they're fine. They are single source of truth. You need them. I'm a finance person, right? It's important that you have a single repository of your data. You close the books every month, every quarter, every year uh, for your auditors. Uh, it is typically where you house your financial reporting, uh, where you have your master data. Uh, both for direct and indirect, uh, you do your payments out of, although you no longer really need to do that. You can do that in Coupa if you want. Um, but my point is like, that is the single source of truth, which is really critical, um, where technology like Coupa or, you know, uh, source day or, or others come in, uh, you know, uh, the CRM with Salesforce and, and workday for HRMS. And, you know, you've got some other platforms, of course, and, and Zendesk and, and, uh, service now and is recognizing that the ERP is not necessarily very friendly to use, uh, is not necessarily uh, very intuitive. And that's where a company like I work for um, has recognized the opportunity to, to simplify, to make that, that experience much more seamless and easy. Uh, so you get to high level of adoption, uh, both from the supplier side and the internal user side. And now you get data at your fingertips and you no longer just look at where spend gets booked because procurement doesn't really care. I don't really care if it's CapEx or OpEx or if it's SGNA or no, for me, it's spend. And I need to know what do we buy? How much do we buy? Where do we buy from? Why do we buy? What's my demand category management? Those, those stuff. That's what matters to procurement. And that's what, what, you know, the company I represent or work for uh, has been able to do. So, um, so yeah, that's the, those are the, dis the distinctions between ERP and, 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 and more like a best, uh, you know, best of breed, uh, you know, end to end solution like, like ours. So there's a lot of niche 
category solutions on the market now. How do you figure out which one is best for you? Yeah, I, I am a big fan. I, I'm not trying to, this is not a Cooper sales pitch yeah, at any point. Yeah, so I, I am certainly not trying to do that. Um, I'm a big fan of thinking about a process end to end. Uh, so from, you know, in, in my profession, sourcing, contracting, rec to PO, PO to invoice, invoice to pay, managing risk, managing the life cycle of your contracts, uh, you know, the payments, treasury, cash flow. I like to think of it like that. And for me, it's more important that I have, I don't have to deal with, you know, point solutions, but that I can do that in one single platform so that I have single source of truth. Uh, I don't have to deal with uh, integration. Um, I can very quickly run metrics, so, you know, source the contract cycle time and spend to PO and uh, spend on the contract and rec to PO cycle times. And those things really matter to procurement. How quickly can I support the business? Um, so I'd like to think of it more of a, like, if there is something I can do end to end, then that's what I would select. Um, so I would never deploy, uh, a contract lifecycle management solution individually. I would never do that or a risk solution. There's great solutions out there. Yeah. So I'm not discounting, uh, those solutions, but, um, I'm a big fan of thinking about it end to end and whether that's on the procurement side or on the CRM side, uh, on the HRMS side, I'm a big fan of thinking end to end rather than. Uh, if you can, yeah, I would never just have a talent module, you know, or um, a recruiting module or uh, a, perf a performance re review for if you talk about HRMS, uh, I would rather have, you know, an end to end, which may mean you have to sacrifice a little bit of functionality individually, but then the benefits you're going to get to have it end to end are far greater. Where does data fit into all of this? Yeah, I, data is, you know, data has always been king. And and I remember when I started in procurement, I had AS400 in ER, as an ERP, and I had to download an AP subledger file into Excel and manually classify all my spend to use some kind of taxonomy, which I used UNSPSC. Can't believe I did that, yeah. I had 10,000 suppliers, uh, 130,000 invoices a year, if memory serves, and I was manually classifying it. And um, so data is king. I need to know or gold or, you know, however you want to describe it. Um, I need to know my data at my fingertips. I need to know what I buy, how much I buy, how much I spent uh, very, very quickly. Um, and um, so having accurate data at your fingertips is, is absolutely fundamental. Uh, I mean, it's been fundamental for a decade. Uh, the solutions are out there, again, depending on what kind of data you're looking for, if it's on the HR side or the sales side or the procurement side or maybe on, on help desks or um you know I, I think it's absolutely fundamental if you if you don't know i say to practitioners if you don't know like i ask them typically three fundamental questions you know what's your spend on the contract and what's your total addressable spend and what's your total spend if you don't have those three answers like this then um i i question uh your um, ability to be in procurement so uh, yeah. you you transitioned kind of a did a little bit of an interesting career <laughs> hop and in that you went to work for a supplier. So walk walk us through kind of what your day to day is and what it's like being a CPO for a supplier. Um, yeah, I never really looked at it like that, to be honest. Um, I also don't, you know, I, I, I never look at a company like Coupa when I was on the receiving end as a supplier. It's more like a, you know, strategic partner, but fair enough. I, I see where you're going. Um, what my day looks like at Coupa um, today is I probably spend 30% uh, of my time on procurement, roughly. Um, I've got an excellent team, uh, high performing. I'm very grateful uh, that we have such a, I, I really have a really great team. I've pretty much throughout my career, to be honest, I've been pretty blessed with the teams that I, uh, I've i been able to to support. Um, so uh, I have to call that out. But uh, so I spend 30% of my time on procurement. Um, I probably spend roughly 20% of my time or so on maybe 15, depending on when, but on the product uh supporting you know we've got a really great team uh developing the Coupa platform the bsm platform um and um so I, I get to play a role it's a small role yeah but 
uh, get some early reads on dashboards or things that the product team are thinking about and asking me, hey, does this make sense? And 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 um, they they value my opinion. So I appreciate that. And it's that's part of building your own car. And then the third thing is, is of course, uh, the advocacy. That's, to be truthful, the biggest reason why I joined Coupa is, you know, I, I love this company. The culture is great, et cetera. I've been a big fan. And the way this company has been led by Rob and the, the exec team. And I mean, I, I'm not trying to blow smoke here at any point, but, um, but it's, it's because I love procurement and I will never do anything but procurement. You can quote me. Um, you know, I'm super passionate. I mean, we've known each other for probably like a decade now, Sarah, so maybe a little less, but we've known each other for a long time. You know that I've been very, very passionate about this profession. And I've always said that procurement deserves a seat. Uh, nobody needs to give me the seat. I'll grab it. I, we've earned it, especially now, but even five years ago, 10 years ago, I've always believed that. And to be given an opportunity to advocate for procurement uh, at a company like Coupa, you know, where better can I be, right? So I'm, I'm also, you know, um, I, I believe I'm, I'm at the right company uh, at the right time, as I said earlier. Uh, and that's what I love doing most is to talk about procurement, support our community, uh, talk to prospects, not from a, hey, you need to buy Coupa, but hey, let's get on this procurement transformative journey together and see where we can share, exchange ideas. You know, it's the the none of us is as smart as all of us kind of concept uh, that we love applying. It's the community. And just to play a role in that is, is um, yeah, I sometimes say I can't believe I get paid for this. What makes a great CPO in 2022? Um, wow. Um, well, I know several really awesome CPOs. Um, I think that the CPO of 2022 uh, is is almost like a CEO. Um, you know, I've said that the CPO should be in the running of the CEO job. Um, I, I've talked about that not long ago. And what I mean with that is, um, you know, empathy is important. Emotional intelligence is extremely, extremely important. I had to teach myself. I'm still learning. I'm not great at it. I think I'm getting better at it. Um, but, you know, empathy and, and natural does not come natural to, to most men. Uh, you know, emotional intelligence, same thing. Maybe I'm, I'm getting myself in trouble here. Uh, but I mean, I, I think it's a really key trade, what I'm seeing. Um, um, you don't necessarily need to know commodities and, and, you know, be a 30 year lifelong uh, procurement negotiator anymore. I don't think that's ne necessary. Mm -hmm. Diversity in teams, building the right team, recognizing diversity is critical in your team, um, supporting your team, uh, letting your team run the business, uh, you know, give them the trust and, and uh, the empowerment almost. Um, I think those things are really critical. I mean, of course, it's under, it's important that you know how to how to get people excited about procurement and and convincing people and stakeholder engagement. Those things are all important. But I think the key things for me are more on the softer side than on the harder side. If that I hope that makes sense. For those that are listening that have the end goal of being a CPO, what things can people do now in their careers to get the right? exposure and skills to be considered for a CPO role in the future? Yeah, I've always believed in controlling your own destiny. And, um, you know, I, I think the things that you can do now are things like, um, you know, build your network. Um, think about, you know, think about how you build your network. I mean, I always say like, you know, spend at least an hour a week, not in your career, but on your career. Um, you know, it's important that, of course, you perform and you do things well, um, but certainly encourage you all to uh, to be, to work on your career. And you do that by, you know, networking, reaching out to people. I feel free to reach out to me if you want to talk about procurement in more depth. Uh, I'm, I'm all for sharing and, and learning from each other uh, because I believe that together we, we legitimately drive better outcomes. Um, so work on your career. Um, be bold in your job. Um, go pick a category. I'm sure every company has a category that's underutilized, maybe has been underexplored, under-resourced, whatever, um, and run run with it. I mean, that's what I did. I mean, I took shopping bags. I, I digested it. I dissected it. 
Uh, and I went to the CFO and I said, we can take out a million bucks if we do these five things. And he's like, well, let's go do it. And that's what got me into procurement. But then not shortly after, uh, I was asked what my next gig was at VF. And I said, I'm going to leave the company. And that's when I was given an opportunity to lead global transformation. So my point is not that was not to impress anybody. It's more um, nobody is going to give it to you on a silver platter. Take some risk. Be bold. Control your destiny. Uh, but, you know, I, I do believe in in a certain amount of, uh, you know, you get what you give. And, and you know, I, I, I hope that makes sense there how I'm trying to describe it. But it's really, you know, don't wait for things to land on your lap. You know, that's just never going to happen. You know, you just get get out there and trust your instinct, trust your gut. We are in procurement. I mean, this is our time. If there's never been a better time to be in procurement than today. If you go look on LinkedIn, type in procurement on the, the job search and you'll see opportunities everywhere. And so I highly encourage all of us in procurement, especially uh, to step up. I mean, this is our time. What's something that you haven't yet done in your career that you want to do? Um, wow. <laughs> What's something that I haven't done in my career that I'd like to do? I don't know. I, that's, I, 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 I don't have a good answer for that question. Um, what is something that I would like to do that I haven't? I don't know. Let me think. Maybe I'll get back to you on that. Let, let me give that some thought. Let me, I, I don't have a great answer right now. So that's, that's a great question, but I'm not sure if I got a good answer. Biggest impact you've made in your career? Yeah, I, I'd have to say uh, Lululemon uh, for sure. Uh, although at VF, it was also quite impactful. But, um, you know, that was a company, high growth, uh, had some challenges in supply chain and procurement. Uh, a lot of people forgot about seven years ago. Um, and and together with the group, yeah, we were kind of brought in to build some some governance and some structure and some build some controls um and um i really feel like you know it's never one person uh you can never point to this thing or but i do believe that without procurement and without the resource inefficiencies that we uncovered uh during especially the first two three years of my journey there uh, it allowed the company to invest in uh in digital in e-commerce in omnichannel in, and um yeah, it, it, I really feel like we had a really big impact there as a group, uh, supported, of course, by uh, a group. Um, and um, yeah, I, I really felt like there was some some really good things that we did there that ultimately, I mean, the company now is like six billion in sales. And of course, there's great product and product development and, uh, you know, lots of great people there. But um, I, I feel like there's there's definitely we did some really cool things there. I'm a Lulu customer. Thank you for your business, or I used to say that. Um, one of the things that you've shared with me before is that you like to develop people. That's something that's a passion of yours. What makes you a good leader? Yeah, you'd have to ask my team. Yeah, um, to be honest, like I, I mean, I can say what I, what how I like to what what I'd like them to respond if you'd ask somebody that has ever reported to me. Um, I think, um, you know, if it, the way I lead is I set a really high bar. Um, I, I am for myself. Uh, I'm very demanding, but I, I think it has to start with me, with me. So I'd say lead by example uh, has, has always mattered to me. Uh, also, you know, if, if I look at good leaders that I've reported to, and let's say leaders that had some room for improvement, um, I, I think it is lead by example. Um, say what you do, do what you say. Um, you know, empowering my team has always been important to me. Um, you know, I'm not here to babysit anybody. Um, I want my team to feel empowered. Um, and um, But also that it's create an environment where it's okay to make mistakes. You know, fail fast, uh, ideally, move on. Um, I, I think those are key traits, I think, that I like, that I've liked about how I've been managed. Okay to fail, show them that I have their back um, and empower them, you know, really empower them. Not, you know, like if somebody's done something really well, a great, 
a piece of project or I don't know, some great outcome. It's for them to take that to leadership, to my, my boss, uh, to Tony, to who supports me. Um, I don't want to take credit for someone else's work. And, um, and I think it's really important that you do that. And what I have noticed is that there are leaders out there that don't think like that. And that I think comes from a place of fear and a place of uh, insecurity. Um, and the leaders that I've worked best with are the ones that gave me empowerment and, uh, you know, ability to learn, but also gave me exposure. Uh, and it's really important because if I'm not at Coupa tomorrow, then the company still needs to know who my team is and what they do and why they're so good at it. And it shouldn't be just, you know, I shouldn't be like, you know, does that make like I, I, leaders that do that, I, I think have no place in 2022 or in, you know, ever in history, but especially today. When you're hiring someone, what are the things you look for? Attitude. I mean, that to me is king. Um, you know, I hire attitudes over resumes any day. So I typically know after five minutes if I will hire someone or not. And it maybe sounds a little crazy, but attitude to me, like I, procurement is a teachable skill um, and um, uh, you can train it. Um, but I, I care. What I, it's very difficult to train is attitude is... Um, um, you know, things like natural curiosity uh, is um, getting passionate about procurement. And that's not easy to teach that to somebody. You know, uh, I'd rather slow somebody down than to speed somebody up. Right. And um, and so I, I hire attitude. And if somebody can, you know, can tell a good story, storytelling is really important in procurement. Um, and um, but if somebody has the ability to excite people and, and rally t people and, and bring things to close. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think that is really critical, but also diversity. So that doesn't mean that you hire the same people all the time because I, that does not drive. Like if everybody is like me on my team, that'd be a disaster, right? That'd be an absolute disaster. So you also need to find the right balance between not just gender. Yeah. Cause I know that's very typically people start to think about equality, like, you know, diversity in terms of gender, but it's also ethnicity. Uh, religion is important. Upbringing, uh, anytime ending. Um, uh, um, but also education. They don't all need to have a finance background. In fact, there's no procurement school, which I think is something we need to fix and Coupa should lead that discussion. Uh, together with you know source days and others that are in the space but um definitely uh you know higher engineers i've hired eas in procurement in europe um i've hired uh um, um somebody that was in um in hr um and the reason why is they know how to resonate with people how to um get quickly like if you're an ea I mean, they're the multitask galores, right? I mean, they know how to get shit done, right? Uh, multitask, prioritize. To some degree, that's procurement, right? And, um, you know, work on the pressure and stress and, and serve many different. So I, I think those are skills that I look for. So it's attitude over, over resume for me. You, you mentioned um, stress in your last comment. How do you juggle so much between family, work, hobbies? Yeah, I, I think I'm not good at it. Um, you can ask my wife. I mean, you should interview her. Um, you know, she she regularly reminds me uh, that your health is should always be number one. Um, and I that's a constant battle for me. Um, I love my work. I'm very, very passionate about my work. I've always been, I'm not going to call myself a workaholic, but I do spend a lot of time uh, in my job because it energizes me. And, um, but yeah, sometimes I need to learn to unplug and it's very, very difficult for me to unplug. So I'm, I'm not here, I'm not gonna give any advice because I would not be truthful and I would not be authentic, which are two of my core values, if you will. And um, so I'm, I'm, jugg I'm struggling with that. I, my priority is, my, is always my family, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I always show that. So, so it's we've a got a nonstop journey for me. 
We've got a question that came in from the audience from Miriam that I want to make sure we have time to address. She says, can you recommend a tool or template in which procurement can communicate its accomplishments to management? Uh, yes, Mariam, uh, I can. Uh, why don't you uh, reach out to me? I'm, I'm happy to, to share how I've done that. Um, but it, it all starts with, um, you know, not just being focused on cost, uh, but it starts to be the value drivers that procurement can bring to the table. So it's not just about taking out cost, especially in today's market, it's almost impossible uh, with inflation being, you know, double digit, et cetera. Um, I have some templates I'm, I'm happy to share, um, but it's about value drivers. So first and foremost, know your baseline. What is the baseline of what it is that you're that you're procuring, whatever it is, goods or services, get alignment on that baseline um, and then determining what the value drivers can be. And that can be better quality, uh, lower lead time, um, you know, maybe de-risking your supply chain, diversity, ESG is a big deal, of course, today. And so talk about what matters to the executive team. Like, how do you demonstrate value uh, can, can come from different angles. Uh, I definitely have a template that, that I'm happy to share. Um, but I, I think it's important that we stop talking about cost and taking out cost. There was another gentleman, I, I forgot his name, but he, he made that comment as well around, hey, it's not just no longer about just taking out cost. That was easy five years ago, right? But today we should be talking about, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, now remember it was you. Um, um, you know, we should move beyond that. And it's really, really important. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or my email address is very simple. It's mvk at coupa.com. Just drop me an email. All right. So we are at Spitfire round time. I'm going to ask you five questions and you're going to respond with the first okay. word or phrase that comes to mind. Okay. Go for it. Accomplishment you are most proud of. Kids. Quality you admire most in yourself. Uh, perseverance. What's your dream? Um, what's, Jesus. Um, what's my dream? Fuck. Uh, what's my dream? Uh, uh, grandkids. Biggest pet peeve? Uh, taking things too personal. Favorite thing to do in your downtime? Uh, yeah, it's spend time with my children, like I have to say. All right. Well, with that, I want to give a big thank you to MVK for spending an hour on our show today. For those that want to reach out to him, best way to do so is LinkedIn or shoot him an email. And tune in for our show next month, which will be July 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Sarah.